the second vote to be around 11.45 or noon. I ask that the witnesses and members bear with us as we recess briefly for these two votes. With that, I now recognize myself uh, for an opening statement. Good morning and thank you all for being here today. Today's hearing comes at a perilous time for the 2020 census. Last month, there were troubling press reports indicating that career officials at the Census Bureau warned the Trump administration about significant problems that will delay the delivery of census data to late January or early February. After these reports uh, became public, the director of the census, Dr. Stephen D Dillingham, issued a public statement confirming that problems were found, but he provided few details. These developments were particularly troubling because they were not reported to our committee before we read about them in the press or before the census director made his public statement. Our committee has direct jurisdiction over the census, but nobody from the Trump administration informed us about any of these problems or delays. For these reasons, the committee wrote a letter to the Census Bureau on November 19th. We asked for documents that career officials prepared describing these data problems and the resulting delays. We also requested documents that were prepared for the Department of Commerce, including Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross. But in response to our request, they gave us nothing, absolutely nothing, not even a single page. These documents were due a week ago, and the census is in its most critical stage. Yet the Trump administration seems to believe that they owe Congress nothing, no documents whatsoever. Last week, we held a bipartisan staff briefing with the director and his top aides. We asked them why they hadn't turned over any of the documents we were seeking. In response, they pointed to Secretary Ross's office at the Commerce Department. They explained that they collected documents and sent them to Secretary Ross's general counsel, but that they were, quote, not cleared for release, end quote. When our staff asked, why not? They indicated that Secretary Ross's office is withholding these documents due to concerns about, quote, ongoing litigation, end quote. This is entirely unacceptable. The existence of separate litigation is not a valid reason to withhold documents from Congress. In addition, the administration's claim that they are withholding these documents because of ongoing litigation raises serious questions about whether they are seeking to conceal information, not just from Congress, but from the judiciary. Just this week on Monday, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in a case involving the president's order to exclude undocumented immigrants from the census count. At the same time, the Trump administration was blocking these documents from coming out. Nevertheless, despite the Trump administration's obstruction, our committee has now been able to obtain three of these internal documents from another source. These internal documents not only confirm that the Census Bureau will not take until at least uh, late January to resolve these data problems and produce a complete and accurate count but that these problems are more serious than first reported. These internal documents show that rather than getting better, these problems may be getting worse. Written by career professionals, these documents describe 15, 15 more than a million records in every state in our nation. These problems could affect state population counts, impact representation in Congress, and reduce funding states are due under a host of federal programs. These internal documents describe an intensive 11-step process to fix the errors. They also warn that taking shortcuts and trying to rush this process could aggravate the situation further and lead to even more problems. 
As I said, the Trump administration tried to block our committee from seeing these documents. We had to get them from another source. The administration has claimed publicly that they are addressing these problems by bringing in more resources. But we do not have the information we need to check these claims. The Trump administration is preventing our committee from verifying the scope of these data problems, their impact on the accuracy of the census, and the time career professionals need to fix them. For these reasons, the committee sent a letter yesterday to Wilbur Ross, the Secretary of Commerce. We gave him until next Wednesday to produce a complete and unredacted set of the documents we requested last month. I ask uh, unanimous consent to place the record, this letter in the record and that it be made of the part of the hearing record. So ordered. These documents should be made available to Congress, to the judiciary, if necessary, and to the American people so that we all have confidence in the census numbers going forward. But so far, the Trump administration has tried to keep this information secret from everyone. As our letter explains, if Secretary Ross fails to comply with our request voluntarily, he will receive a friendly subpoena. The Constitution charges Congress with key responsibilities over the census. And we need these documents to ensure that it is complete and accurate. Our witnesses today are experts in the fields of data science, census operations, and the use of census data by cities and states to provide services and improve the lives of the American people. I look forward to hearing their expert opinions about the new documents we obtained, as well as the other significant challenges faced by the census. I now recognize Ranking Member Comer for his opening statement, and I yield back. Chairman Maloney, I appreciate you calling this hearing today on the 2020 Census. Let me begin by saying unequivocally, the 2020 Census is counting every resident in the United States, regardless of citizenship status. The Census Bureau has already counted 99.98% of households in the United States. The remaining two one hundredths of a percent of unresolved addresses will be resolved by accepted and long-standing statistical methods. But the Democrats still seem uninterested in these facts and instead are launching partisan attacks on the 2020 census to undermine the public's confidence in the results. Today's hearing supposedly is about the completeness and accuracy of the 2020 census. But just as for our last hearing, no Census Bureau witnesses have been invited to testify. So it's unclear to me what we expect to learn today. During trans transcribed interviews earlier this year, Census Bureau career staff made clear the Bureau was committed to a complete and accurate census. They are working to deliver on this commitment. The Bureau has made clear that the issues it has encountered in completing the current phase of the census are few in number, relate to only 63 one hundredth percent of the data for the census do not call into question the quality of the data and are on par with issues arising in past censuses. Bureau officials can confirm they are working quickly and efficiently as possible with all available resources to finalize a complete and accurate census. While there likely will be a short delay in delivery of apportionment results, that isn't because of problems with the completeness and accuracy of the census data. It's because of a delay imposed earlier in the year resulting from activist litigation. Just this week, just this week, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in the challenge to President Trump's directive that the Secretary of Commerce report an apportionment count that excludes non-legal residents in the United States, including illegal immigrants. That directive was a very important step to ensure the sanctity of our nation's elections and equal representation under the Constitution. Including illegal immigrants in the count for representation in Congress only dilutes 
the representation of all Americans who vote in elections and makes a mockery of our basic principle of one person, one vote. I urge us all to focus on the real tasks at hand, supporting the Census Bureau's extraordinary efforts to complete an accurate 2020 census count, not undermining public confidence in its work product. Given that we've already held hearings on the 2020 census and the Bureau is on track to complete and accurate count, our time would be better spent getting to the bottom of whether the integrity of the 2020 election was compromised. During the 2020 election, we witnessed blanket mail-in balloting in several states and a dramatic rise in absentee ballots in others, leading to errors and irregularities. For example, I sent a letter to the Election Assistance Commission Inspector General asking them to investigate why the California Secretary of State used $35 million of taxpayer money to pay Joe Biden's main election campaign advisory firm to conduct voter contact. I'd like to know why taxpayer money was used in such a questionable manner. But unfortunately, the Inspector General has yet to take any action. Also, on November 18th, Judiciary Committee Ranking Member Jim Jordan and I called upon Chairwoman Maloney and Judiciary Committee Chairman Nadler to hold hearings to investigate election irregularities. Why aren't we starting those hearings today instead of holding yet another hearing on the Democrats' partisan campaign against the 2020 census? Democrats have found ample time to hold countless hearings on partisan issues to undermine President Trump and further their left-wing agenda, but they won't hold a single hearing on election integrity and protecting the sanctity of the ballot box? These priorities speak for themselves, and with that, I yield back. Now I will introduce our witnesses. Our first witness today is Christopher, Christopher Mem, who is the Managing Director of the Strategic Issues Team at the Government Accountability Office. Then we will hear from Robert Santos, who serves as the Vice President and Chief Methodologist for the Urban Institute, and is also the President-elect of the American Statistical Association. Next, we will go to Joseph Salvo, who is the Chief Demographer of the Population Division at the New York City Department of City Planning. Finally, we will hear from Jeff Landry, who is the Attorney General for the state of Louisiana. The witnesses will be unmuted so we can swear them in. Please raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. I'll let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Without objection, your written statements will be made part of the record. With that, Mr. Mim, you are now recognized for your testimony. Well, thank you, ma'am. And Chair, Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, members of the committee, um, I am very pleased to once again appear before you to discuss the progress of the 2020 Census. In being here, I have the very great pleasure of presenting the work of my dedicated GAO colleagues who have been supporting the Census or supporting the Congress on census issues for many years. As this committee is well aware, the 2020 census was undertaken under extraordinary circumstances. In response to COVID-19 and related executive branch decisions, the Bureau made a series of late design changes uh, that uh, affected the way the Bureau did its work and the time that it took to do that work. These changes also introduced risks into the quality of the census that the, that the Bureau census data that the Bureau will provide for congressional apportionment in redistricting. As Mr. Comer noted in his opening statement, the professionals at the Census Bureau are deeply committed to providing an accurate and complete census count to the, for apportionment, redistricting, and for other purposes. My bottom line, therefore, today is that it is important both for transparency and to ensure public confidence in the quality of the census that the Bureau share key indicators of data completeness and accuracy in near real time as it releases apportionment and redistricting data. Today, we are issuing the first in a, a series of our planned reports 
that will assess the operations of the 2020 census and identify lessons learned as planning begins for 2030. And unfortunately, it's not too early to already be thinking about planning for the 2030 census. That report, entitled 2020 Census, Census Bureau Needs to Assess Data Quality Concerns Stemming from Recent Design Changes, recommends that the Commerce, Department of Commerce and the Bureau evaluate possible data quality implications and lessons learned, including the operational successes of the Bureau's response to COVID-19. We are very pleased that the Department of Commerce has agreed with that recommendation, again, underscoring a commitment to a complete and accurate census. Recently, as the committee is aware, the American Statistical Association and the Census uh, Scientific Advisory Committee issued numerous recommendations, including that the Bureau document what it knows about the quality of the population counts that it provides to the President and to the Congress. Consistent with our report, the recommendation that Commerce accepted and the work of these organizations, my written statement details some of the census quality indicators that the Bureau should consider providing when it releases those apportionment accounts. More specifically, the Bureau believes, based on longstanding practice, that the self-response from households provides the most accurate census data. However, the Bureau necessarily, at times, uses alt alternative data collection methods when it is unable to obtain census data directly from a household. These alternative methods include proxies that would be neighbors and, and other knowledgeable parties, the use of administrative records, and count imputations. Looking at the rates at which the Bureau used each of these alternative methods would give insight into the overall quality and completeness of the census. Now, the nationwide rates provide a high level indication of overall census quality, and it's important that we take a look at those. However, in our view, and very importantly, the Bureau also needs to examine the rates at which it used each of these alternative methods at lower levels of, of geography and by key demographic groups to provide a, an overall and more complete picture. Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, members of the committee, this completes my statement. I'd obviously be pleased to respond to any questions that you may have. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to take a brief recess because we have a vote in our Democratic Caucus meeting right now, and I want to give all of our members the opportunity to vote. The committee stands in recess for five minutes.
Thank you. Mr. Santos, you are now recognized. Mr. Santos. Uh, thank you and good morning, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, and committee members. It is an honor to assist you today. Please know that these remarks are my own and not to be attributed to the Urban Institute, its trustees, or its funders. The story of, this, of census accuracy is deeper and more complex than the latest chapter on anomalies. These and problems yet to be found reveal the consequences of risks. To help illustrate the challenges to 2020 census accuracy, I start with research conducted by Diana Elliott, Steve Martin, and I last year to explore 2020 census outcomes. This was pre-COVID. We chose three risk scenarios and used Census Bureau research to simulate 2020 counts. The most optimistic scenario mimicked the performance of the 2010 census, which came in within a hundredth of a percent of an independent total population estimate. When we overlaid that performance onto a 2020 population projection, we discovered a net undercount of the population of 0.3%. Stated differently, had the pandemic never happened and the census went as well as it did in 2010, an undercount would occur. People of color are historically undercounted and our wonderful nation had become more racially and ethnically diverse over the past 10 years. While this 2010 census was accurate for the total US population, it came at the expense of fairness. In 2010, whites were overcounted by 0.8%, conveniently making up for net undercounts of people of color. For instance, non-Hispanic blacks had a net undercount of 0.8%, Latinx 1.5%. It is unfair to overcount one sector while undercount, undercounting another to achieve overall accuracy. It reinforces inequities in political representation, federal funding, and economic and public health opportunities for the next 10 years. Why does this matter now? Consider the ongoing pandemic. We see high racial ethnic disparities in rates of job loss, hunger, housing instability, and health. Daily life for people of color often focuses on just meeting basic needs, not completing census forms. That brings us to the basic quality indicator, the self-response rate. Self-response occurs when you complete your own census form. Research shows that lower self-response rates increase the risk of a net undercount. Now, our national 2020 self-response rate was 67%, higher than that of 2010. But in inner city neighborhoods where Latinx, Blacks, and other hard to count folks reside, self-response rates were drastically lower, 50 to 60% or under. While in less diverse suburban areas, they were ultra high at the 70 to 80% or more levels. These disparities varied more in 2020 than in 2010. So people of color are at higher risk of undercounts than in previous censuses. Yet this is just one of many risks that this 2020 census endured. Besides the overarching pandemic, others included the citizenship question fracas, massive population movements, scheduling disruptions, natural disasters, and of course, a shortened data processing period. Each exposes or each poses their own threat to census accuracy. But collection is done, so what's next? Well, we need transparency. The Census Bureau should release data needed to assess the quality of the counts by adopting the recommendations of the American Statistical Association and the Census Bureau's own Scientific Advisory Committee. In closing, I commend the Census Bureau career staff for their dedication, scientific integrity, and oath to uphold the Constitution. They are esteemed and should be allowed to do their jobs unfettered with all due diligence. 
Thank you again, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Salvo, you are now recognized. Mr. Salvo. Good morning, Chair Maloney and members of the committee. On behalf of the mayor and the nearly 8.5 million people in the city of New York, I thank you for having me here today. As New York City's chief demographer, my message today is twofold. One, the schedule for the decennial census must provide the census professional staff with enough time to do their jobs well and in accordance with the rigorous statistical standards we expect. The Census Bureau, two, must be transparent by releasing key indicators and giving Americans confidence in the census. The census has been presented with challenges in the past, but few have been as formidable as those posed by the 2020 census. Among the challenges we have faced, the most pressing has been the toxic mix of fear among many immigrants and their families, combined with a devastating pandemic. Thus, the challenge of overcoming this fear in many immigrant communities has been hampered by the very absence of physical on-the-ground outreach that has been shown to encourage response, especially self-response. In an effort to cope with these extraordinary circumstances, the Secretary of Commerce and the Census Bureau leadership wisely reset the schedule for the 2020 census last April. This provided more time for the all-important non-response follow-up, or as demographers refer to it, NERFU, when census workers knock on doors in order to enumerate those who did not respond on their own. Unfortunately, this revised schedule was upended this past summer, greatly abbreviating the time the Bureau had in the field for NERFU and the time to process the data on the back end. Why should we be concerned? First, the very definition of usual residence was likely upended for many because of movement due to the pandemic. Many persons who were not enumerated at the usual residence as of April 1, 2020. But in other locations, some students and others, for example, in temporary locations with family members or friends or in second homes. For those whose usual residence was in New York City on April 1st, the Census Bureau needs time on the back end to adjust their residence as defined by the Census Bureau. Moreover, such confusion among respondents over where they were supposed to be enumerated in the middle of a pandemic is a virtual guarantee that large-scale duplication of responses will occur. Deduplication using data on forms that sometimes lack important basic information, such as a person's name, is laborious with substantial time required for successful completion of the process. Second, to increase response, the Bureau allowed respondents to write in their addresses without a census ID. This is fine for those who have regular known addresses that can be easily linked to the Census Bureau's master address file, but not for those who have irregular addresses where apartment numbers do not formally exist. The Department of City Planning worked for more than two years identifying these addresses, assigning them apartment designators, and getting them on the Bureau's address list. But without a census ID, the Bureau needs to conduct additional work in the field during NERFU to match these irregular addresses to their master address file. With less time in the field as a result of the abbreviated schedule, it is very likely that many of these cases need to be resolved by the Bureau as part of back-end processing, which, as we all know, has now has been truncated. Third, there is a serious concern about how the Census Bureau, in the midst of a pandemic, achieved a 99 plus percent completion rate in parts of New York City where self-response over a period of five months was less than 50 percent, given this shortened NERFU timetable. The answer is that completed, in quotes, or resolved, again, in quotes, does not necessarily mean, and I quote, enumerated by a household member, close quote. But what does it mean? It could mean that the enumerator determined the unit to not exist. It could have mean that the unit was deemed to be vacant. The cases could have been resolved by contact with a proxy respondent or via administrative records, such as tax returns, social security records. Or the final determination could be an outright refusal 
or no determination could be made for what was believed to be an occupied unit. The Census Bureau needs the time to assess these cases, to evaluate the use of administrative records, or to assign a count to households known to exist using a procedure called statistical imputation. Moreover, metrics need to be produced that reflect how this census was actually completed. For example, what was the level of deduplication? How many persons needed to be reassigned to their April 1 residence? To conclude, one, the schedule for the decennial census must provide the Census Bureau professional staff with enough time to process, evaluate, and correct what we all suspect will be an increased volume of problems with this census due to the pandemic. And second, the Census Bureau must be transparent by releasing key indicators endorsed by the Census Quality Indicators Task Force of the American Statistical Association. Moreover, these metrics have to be provided for small geographic areas, sub-state geographic areas, census tracts, the building blocks of New York City's neighborhoods. This will not only provide data users with confidence in the quality of the data, but will allow the Bureau to maintain its credibility as the nation's premier statistical agency. I thank you and I look forward to questions. Thank you. Mr. Landry, you are now recognized. Mr. Landry. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney, Ranking Member Comer, and members of the Oversight and Reform Committee. It's a privilege to be with you here today. What would be productive today would be for every member of the committee to stipulate that they are in full support of legal immigration. It would be a great place to start. If we can start from that premise that all of us support legal immigration, then we can proceed to deal with immigrants that for whatever reason or circumstance are in this country illegally. From there, we would move to what the definition of a citizen is, because to have a nation, we must have citizens. To be a citizen means to belong to a sovereign and be bestowed with all of the rights, privileges, and protection of that sovereign, like being eligible for the draft, serving in the military, standing on a jury, voting, contributing to Social Security and other safety net programs, having the allegiance to our country. As the Attorney General and citizen of this country, I take special interest in this issue. This committee is aware that the Constitution requires a count of persons living in the United States every 10 years for the purpose of representative reapportionment. And it places the responsibility with Congress to direct the count by law. To that end, Congress, you all, gave the Secretary of Commerce broad discretion to determine the form and contents of each census. It similarly charged the executive with reporting those results of the apportionment determinations to Congress. An example of the Secretary's broad discretion could be seen in the apportionment of overseas service members. Depending on several characteristics of their service, they are counted either at their usual place of residence or at their military installation. Foreign nationals, tourists, and corporate entities are excluded from the count and apportionment, even though they are technically persons under the law. These alterations come from policy directions of the Secretary, and they are consistent with the language of the Constitution and the goal of promoting equality. They ensure an accurate census and a fair apportionment as the law requires. This was President Trump's goal when issuing his memorandum to the Commerce Secretary. The president's memorandum relies on the powers granted to the executive branch of government by you all, by Congress, and the Constitution. Its aims are simple, to restore equality in voting power by excluding illegal immigrants from the reapportionment base. This is not a difficult fix, certainly not as drastic as, say, adding another state to the union. The fate of three seats does not upend the balance of power. 
we should always seek to ensure a balance of power and recognize that an illegal immigrant's presence should not give one state power over voters in another state. By counting illegal immigrants in the reapportionment base, the federal system incentivizes states to work against that system and against each other. Sanctuary policies that entice illegal entry and shield wrongdoers from justice undermine community safety and the rule of law. But those states and cities implementing these policies also see increased power on the federal stage, thus disenfranchising other states. In this cycle alone, illegal immigrants are projected to grow in giant states like California, Texas, and New York, while states like Ohio, Alabama, and Minnesota would each lose congressional representation. To reiterate, people unlawfully in this country are causing long-standing cha long changes in our democracy by simply being counted. As the Supreme Court has recognized, few interests are more vital to a state than the extent of its representation in the House. Allowing illegal immigration to distort congressional apportionment works an injustice to every state, not just to those bound to lose seats. Illegal immigrants must be excluded from the reapportionment. Otherwise, they disenfranchise other states by unfairly distorting the apportionment of house seats in favor of states with higher concentrations of illegal immigrants. When determining the appropriate balance of power amongst those that wield it, the Constitution demands that all votes be given equal weight. We cannot achieve that precise balance until we adopt policies laid out by the president. I thank the committee for this time and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, we're having some connection issues and with Mr. Landry's presentation, he was wrapping up his presentation. So I, I feel that I, I, I now recognize, recognize myself for five minutes. I, I'd like to begin by asking about the new internal documents obtained by the committee. These documents describe at least 15 different problems that career professionals at the Census Bureau have identified in the data. They also show that career staff have warned the Trump administration that complete and accurate data will not be ready until late January or early February. As I explained earlier, the Trump administration did not want us to see these documents, but we were able to obtain them nevertheless. I understand that our witnesses have now had an opportunity to review these documents. So I'd like to start with a simple question which I hope you can answer with a yes or no. If the administration disregards these data problems and rushes to submit census data before these problems are fixed, would you have a high level of confidence that the data is complete and accurate as required by the Constitution? Mr. Salvo, yes or no? I can't hear you. No. Okay. Mr. Santos, yes or no? No. Mr. Mim, yes or no? Not until they're fixed. No, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Santos, I'd like to ask about a specific problem described in document one. Number one. In this document, career staff identified a data error that could result in skipping records for people who were counted in group quarters, such as college dorms, nursing facilities, and military barracks. 
Career staff warned that this impacts more than 16,000 records, and if not corrected, quote, may result in undercounted persons, end quote. Mr. Santos, why is it a problem to undercount people in group quarters? What is this about? Uh, well, group quarters uh, represent individuals in situations like nursing homes, uh, college dorms, uh, homeless shelters, and the sort. Uh, it's important to count them because they are residents of the United States, and the Constitution requires the Census Bureau to count individuals uh, who are residents. Uh, and with that, uh, it's not surprising that the Census Bureau has encountered a problem with group quarters since the group quarters uh, enumeration was disrupted during the pandemic. So I am not surprised at all that uh, roughly perhaps half of the list of problems that have been revealed thus far are related to group quarters. Uh, undercounting results in underrepresentation. It results in fewer fund, federal fund allocation. It results in an inability to properly plan in urban and rural areas. So we simply can't let that happen. And uh, I encourage the cent that the Census Bureau, as I said, be allowed enough time to sort all of this out and to do the best job it can to come up with the most accurate counts that it can. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Salva, also in document one, career officials identified another error affecting about 46,000 records from people who filled out paper questionnaires in nine states. The career staff wrote, and I quote, if this error isn't corrected, demographic data for persons will be missed and may impact the final population counts. End quote. So, Mr. Salvo, what could the impact be if final state population counts and demographic data are not accurate? My main point would be... Mr. Salvo. Oh, yeah. The, the Census Bureau in those documents um, talked about how um, maybe the problems that they were discussing um, affected maybe seven tenths of a percent of the population. The important point to make is that that is not evenly distributed over the over the uh, geographic areas of the country. And that there are some areas that will be more greatly affected than others. Anything that compromises the content of the decennial census um, will be felt more in some areas than in other areas, and it, it's important to note that. And if I may. Uh, um, Chairwoman Maloney, comment on the group quarters. Can would I can I comment on that, please? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The Census Bureau, because of the truncation of the schedule, they stopped an external review of the group quarters facilities that would be included in the census. They truncated it greatly. That's the first point. And the second point is there are some jurisdictions in this country with large numbers of GQs or group quarters that define who they are. And it's a distribution that uh, affects some areas much more than others. But in so far as your question on content goes, um, we are very concerned that the truncation of the schedule, less time in the field to get those answers has caused the Census Bureau to push their enumerators to a point where frankly, we've compromised the data itself and that's what the metrics that the American Statistical Association has uh, promoted. That's what it gets at. And that's not in the memo, okay? That's not in the memo. We need to go beyond the memo, the quality of the data that they have, quote, corrected. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mim, let me ask about, uh, about the last page of document number one where it lists considerations and risks. In the final bullet, the career staff set forth a stark warning. They explained that they are working on a comprehensive patch with more than a dozen individual patches to address all these problems. But then they say this, and I quote, 
if the sequencing of patch deployment isn't executed properly, it may result in other data anomalies, end quote. Mr. Mim, in other words, if they try to rush this, they could aggravate the process and result in even more problems, is that right? Mr. Mim. Yes, ma'am. There's, there's two actually concerns that, uh, that, that we have and, and I think that are, are shared by the Census Bureau. One is the, the rushing, as you mentioned, there, the, these patches have to be put in place, they have to be tested, and then you have to see whether or not you have to do the comprehensive fix to see whether or not they all work together. And we're still talking about the, the first stage of the data processing. There's other stages yet to come before the apportionment data comes out. The Bureau is, is certainly going to be looking at that. We know from history that there will, they can expect that there will be additional anomalies that will show up there. The expectation, of course, based on, on history is that they will be fewer and less significant. Um, but we're not certain of that. And, and, I, uh, and if I would say if there is something that's probably keeping the, the Bureau up at night as they process it, that is probably it. What is going to be this, the second round, if any, of anomalies? How big will they be? And will they be more than, than historically expected? And could that lead to less accurate data and even more delays, correct, Mr. Mitt? It could certainly lead to, to more delays. And, it, and you know, the, the important thing to, as, as uh, a number of people have already pointed out, is that we, we are dealing with, with relatively small numbers in a, in a country of, you know, 330, 340 million people. Um, yet the small numbers are what turn the last congressional seat. In, in 2000, for example, the, the last seat was determined on a population difference of, of less than 1,000 people. In 2010, it was uh, uh, less than 16,000 people. Now, it, you know, I, I don't want to imply that all of these problems are that you know, concentrated that they're going to turn one seat. Um, but rather, Sounds it's, good. you know, small numbers are do have a big impact at this point in the census. Thank you. Clearly, the data errors in these internal documents are significant and widespread, affecting all 50 states. They must be fully addressed by career experts, and our committee must be given the documents we requested in order to verify that these errors have been fully addressed. I thank all of the witnesses, and uh, I'd now like to call on Mr. Massey. You are now recognized for questions. Mr. Massey. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I'd like to ask Attorney General Landry if he could uh, go through again for us how the uh, counting or the census counting of illegal immigrants unfairly biases representation here in Congress uh, for certain states. And um, if he could explain to us which, how that's going to affect apportionment coming up in the next uh, cycle. Oh, I believe you're on mute. Thank Sorry. You. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So if you think uh, states such as uh, rural states with large, po larger populations of, say, senior citizens or states with large populations of African Americans or poorer states, those states should be apportioned equally, right? And, this, and they are all citizens of the country and should be counted. Those states such as California that that uh, embraces sanctuary city policies and basically attracts uh, illegal immigrants to those cities are then unevenly weighted. And so those citizens in other states are therefore disenfranchised when we reapportion uh, the seats in, in Congress. And so that's exactly what the president was recognizing. He wanted to make sure that all citizens were represented equally uh, in the country, in the U.S. House of Representatives. So if uh, California gets an extra seat or, or two extra seats because of uh, we're counting illegal aliens in California, those, there are only 435 seats in Congress. That means that some state or states somewhere are going to lose representation. Is that correct? That's correct. So right now, uh, based upon what we're seeing, you would think that what we're seeing is that Minnesota, Ohio, and Alabama may be losing uh, a congressional seat. So therefore, African Americans in Minnesota, Alabama, and Ohio, senior citizens in those particular states are therefore going to be disenfranchised at, at, and at the expense of illegal aliens in California. 
And then this sets up a perverse incentive for states to, if they want to get another representative in Congress, to incentivize illegal immigration into their states, doesn't it? That's correct. It's gonna it's gonna create uh, basically a, um, a a competition between states to try to attract illegal immigrants in their states, rather than the way that Ronald Reagan always said that people can vote with their feet by basically going into states and citizens moving from one state to another based upon, say, economic means or, or opportunities. Uh, it was interesting that we heard uh, from uh, one of the witnesses uh, when he talked about the, the amount of resources that could be restricted uh, to, say, minority communities or, again, the senior citizens. Again, counting illegals in that basically, again, take resources away from minority communities in other states like Minnesota, Alabama, and Ohio. Thank you, Attorney General. Uh, you know, I'm glad we had a chance to discuss this issue in this hearing because a lot of my constituents are incredulous when they find out that the census actually counts illegal aliens who are in this country and that apportionment is therefore is then based on that. They don't even believe that that's actually happening, but it is happening. So I think it's uh, I think it's good that we had this hearing for that reason. But there are other hearings we should be having that we're not having, Madam Chairwoman. For instance, you know, this stimulus bill that we passed, they're twelve hundred dollar checks. We just found out a billion of those, a billion dollars worth of those. I'm sorry, over a billion dollars worth of these stimulus checks went to deceased individuals. And the check says deceased on it. I'd like to have a hearing on why are we sending $1,200 checks to deceased people? Also, it just came out uh, in an NPR article that uh, the IRS admits that they are sending $1,200 stimulus checks overseas to non-Americans. Why are we sending, when we have Americans in need, why are we sending $1,200 stimulus checks to non-Americans overseas? I, had a Norwegian who sent me a copy of his father's check. The man's lived in Oslo since the 1970s. Uh, he's a Norwegian citizen, not a dual citizen, received a $1,200 check, does not file a US tax return. Can we please have a hearing on the waste, fraud, and abuse? And I've just scratched the surface that's gone on uh, with this stimulus program. Adding insult to injury, I know hundreds of my constituents, many of them in the military, we still haven't received the $1,200 check. And I think it's an insult to our uh, soldiers serving overseas that, you know, I know it's hard to get people to respond to a census sometimes, but we know every member of the military. We tell them when to get up, what to eat, what to go, yet we can't find them in order to send them a $1,200 check. And we're sending them to rich Norwegians overseas. I think this is a problem and it deserves a hearing. And I yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman for his uh, questions, and uh, the GAO did, in fact, do a report on checks going to de deceased persons and pointed out ways to stop that. There is legislation in before Congress right now uh, that would stop that process uh, uh, from going forward. Uh, we will have a hearing on it and, and follow up on it, and I now uh, recognize uh, Mrs. Norton, Congresswoman M Norton. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. I thank you for this hearing. I think it's very important that we get beneath the surface, uh, and this hearing is doing that. Now, I have a, a particular question because I was a professor of law at Georgetown Law School before I was elected to Congress and even continue to serve, uh, that is to, to teach one course. Uh, at the law school after coming to Congress. So I'm particularly interested in students uh, because I recognize that they present a major challenge. After all, they uh, often have what amount to two addresses. They live uh, at home and they live off campus. Now they are supposed to be counted in their off campus or house dorm housing but of course COVID now complicates matters and many of them uh, have been forced to go back home um mr milm uh, I, I i'm concerned about 
counting these students, uh, particularly since even before the virus, the Department of Just uh, Commerce Inspector General found that the Census Bureau had been undercounting off-campus student households. Now, that's I guess that's be before we got into the present complications. Uh, they said that the Bureau's efforts to collect data on off-campus students from college and university administrators, and here I'm quoting them, will not mitigate the risk of an inaccurate count because the Bureau has not, does not have a final plan in place to use off-campus student data. Now, when you consider the complications of the virus, that really concerns me, Mr. Milne. Uh, are you concerned that college students who live on off-campus will be undercounted, and what do you think we should be doing about it, especially given what the Census Bureau had to say about this matter uh, it, that this report was issued on August 27th? Ma'am, your, your concern is, is very, very well-founded. And what's interesting is that historically, college students uh, living at school have been uh, among the most overcounted population, that is double-counted, that they are counted both at their university, usually where they should be because it is their usual residence, and they find that their family will also count them back at home. You know, and so it's typically been the, the, in the other direction. The Census Bureau did work very hard with universities to try and, and get an accurate count of the, the students in both in their dorms, that was an easier kind of lift for the Census Bureau to work with the universities who would have been there. The much more difficult one, as you're pointing out, is for students that were living in off-campus housing. Um, in some cases, the universities um, had that information and shared it. In many cases, they didn't have the, the complete information of students living off-campus. Um, and in some cases, they were reluctant to share that, that information with the with the Census Bureau. The basic procedures that the Census Bureau would use in those circumstances are consistent with what you would use in, uh, to enumerate any other unit, um, using proxy data, other administrative data when they when they could, and in the end, if they have to, using imputations. But your question is very, a concern is very well founded now. Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Milm, um, many students, uh, according to the information, uh, I have, I think I'm backing up what I heard you say, that uh, many universities provided data to the Census Bureau about students in campus housing, but, and when I don't understand this, they had not cooperated with requests to help count students who live off campus. Why weren't they cooperating with these requests? They should have had the data. Yes, in, in, in cases where they did have that data and, and weren't willing to share it with the Census Bureau, ma'am, frankly, it's, it's not clear why, um, or at least uh, I don't have a, a good explanation to that I, you know, for you on, on that. Um, you would think that they would be willing to do it. It would certainly be in the best interest of the university and the local community where that university resides to make sure that there's an accurate count in, in, in that community. Uh, I'm gonna ask the chair, uh, to look into the matter of what the Congress can do to make sure that um, universities do in fact cooperate in the future, uh, because I don't see any reason for that. Uh, uh, I, I don't see any reason for, for that. Has my, time, has my time expired? Yes, it has, and thank you for raising it, and we will look into it. And get Thank back you. to you. I now uh, recognize Mr. Gosar. You are now recognized uh, for your questions. You're you're still muted. You're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Now we can hear you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Well, I don't know how many times I can say it, but it's Groundhog Day once again in the Oversight Reform Hearing today. How, or how many times we can waste American taxpayer dollars to sit here for the Democrats' conspiracy theories, but here we go again. 
When it comes to misrepresenting the data, the majority here has been all too happy to undermine the integrity of the post office and postal service. We'll, we'll keep that in mind. And the Census Bureau to the American people to score cheap political points, only then to turn around and to critique their Republican colleagues for requesting hearings regarding the integrity of the election because of pre-election censorship and irregularities in the vote count. But apparently, even assuring, assuring integrity in the people's government has become a partisan issue. But since we are here, let's get to addressing these, these problems. Mr. Mim, thank you again for appearing before this committee and the several reports your team has issued on the census. In September, when you were last here appeared, I asked you about this unprecedented census and how technology and excellent field work by census workers overcame the challenges posed by COVID and weather barriers. In your team's December GAO report, is it true that you confirmed that the Census Bureau accounted for 99.98% of all households in America? Yes, sir, and Mr. Koser, it's a, it is a pleasure to see you again, sir. Um, yes, they, they, they uh, uh, of their households, they've uh, the, overall the they've, they've done very well on that. Where the bureau tallies the census, your report raises concerns with the amount of time it has to complete an accurate census. I'm sure it would have helped if the census were allowed to end its data collection phase on the September 30th, uh, like it was supposed to. But instead, liberal lawsuits granted in liberal federal courts, which halted the ending of the census by 15 days. There seems to be excuse after excuse to move the goalpost, whether it's COVID lawsuits or even weather, all in a concerted effort to have final counts to be done past inauguration in the hopes of having it out of the hands of the Trump administration. Thank you, Mr. Mim, again for you and your team's work, and thank you for our census workers and the technical support, which has allowed for an unprecedented, unprecedented response rate and tabulation, which means to ensure that the Americans people are counted accurately in a timely fashion. Attorney General Landry, in a democratic society, one person equals one vote is a fundamental notion. The inclusion of illegal aliens in the appropriation apportionment account dilutes this principle, however, because it grants states more seats in the body than they have legal voters. In the fallout from this election, ensuring that each vote is counted and recorded properly is something is there something we must ensure and that starts with granting all Americans an equal vote in a Congress? I want to take issue of the, food, the uh, vote dilution one step further. One strength we have in the census is its accuracy, which I have previously mentioned. Yet every day, hundreds of Americans leave states like New York, Illinois, California. Oh, oh, we lost it. I can't hear anything. We're having some connection issues. We're going to go to uh, Representative Conley for his questions and back to Mr. Gosar if he uh, needs more uh, uh, to, to complete his question. Mr. Conley, Representative Conley, you are now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Chairwoman, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. And first of all, let me begin by thanking you. You've been a stalwart on the whole issue of the census and your leadership matters a great deal. And I salute you and thank you on behalf of my constituents for your advocacy of an accurate but careful census. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chairwoman, for that. Uh, Mr. Mim, the internal documents obtained by the committee explain that the Bureau will in fact not finish fixing the 15 anomalies it's identified and verifying the final census count until late January or even possibly early February. How important is it that the Bureau correct these data anomalies before moving on to the next step in data processing and completing the census count? Uh, Mr. Connolly, the, the Bureau believes that it's absolutely vital that they be corrected before they go on. These, these 15 are what the Bureau has referred to as the critical anomalies. And critical isn't a, a function of size. It's those that are directly centered on the apportionment counts. And so they can be small. Some of them, of course, are, are quite large. 
they need to be fixed before you move on to the, the second stages. And so that's and that's in the Bureau's view. And obviously, we would share that view with the Bureau. Thank you. Uh, according to the Bureau's internal documents, again, the time needed to correct those anomalies, which you say is essential before pr proceeding, include the need for preparation, development, testing, and implementation of fixes. Would you agree that there's just no plausible way to rush or shortcut that correction process without further compromising the quality of the data itself? Well, certainly, sir, rushing or shortcutting would just be an, an enormously risky situation. And, and that, you know, that's what we're focused on with the Bureau. We have, we've asked them for uh, a, a, quite a bit of documentation. We haven't received it yet. It's, it's been uh, reviewed by the Department of Commerce and, and General Counsel over there. Um, so we want to see what is the critical path. What is it's actually that, you know, their, their timeline that's going to get them to delivering the apportionment counts. We've heard, as, as many as others had, they don't have a firm date. They're looking to get it in January at some point. Yeah. And I think it's important to remember that with respect to apportionment, I mean, you know, this is really life or death for many, many communities. Uh, whether a state has, you know, loses a, a representative or could have gained one, but for the lack of accurate data does not, let alone the allocation of federal resources. So, I mean, the stakes are very high for communities all over the country. But we get this right, that we take the time to make sure we get it right. Mr. Santos, you're president-elect of the American Statistical Association, an organization that seeks to promote and practice the professional of statistics, a, a really uh, engaging process. Uh, do you believe outside experts should have the opportunity thoroughly to review the census data before a portion account is finalized? And if so, why? Uh, absolutely. I am actually a big believer in community engaged research. Um, oftentimes uh, folks and programmers uh, running uh, diagnostics to find uh, errors don't realize that they've missed something that's crucial. And the only way that that can be uncovered is by becoming transparent and allowing researchers outside of the uh, Census Bureau access to those data so they can see if basically it passes the laugh test in their local community. Um, I've heard instances of where um, uh, prisons ended up having a zero population because they were allocated by mistake to the county next door. Um, those types of small changes may not affect a state count, but they certainly will affect um, federal funding and planning and so forth within a state. And I'm very concerned about the within state uh, population accuracy. Um, final question, and, and, and as maybe to you, Mr. Mim, again, but there are states that have statewide elections next year. You know, many of us focus on, you know, the other 40-something states that have elections coming up in 2022. But frankly, this census data traditionally has been made available early to Virginia and New Jersey and K Kentucky, I believe. Uh, but certainly New Jersey and Virginia, because we have gubernatorial and state house represent, uh, elections next year. Um, and so we've got to have the reapportionment data to be able to reapportion um, in time for our elections next November, less than 12 months away. Um, how might the, uh, the documents we've uncovered with respect to the census, uh, internal census uh, deliberations uh, and the and the possible delay of that data until January or February, how might that affect states that have early elections and are desperately uh, in need of early census data in order to do their reapportionment before every other state? Mr. Mill. Well, well, Mr. Connolly, as a, as a fellow Virginia resident, I'm, I'm well aware that uh, what you're referring to there, um, the, the biggest risk would probably be the knock-on effect for redistricting data. Um, as you know, that comes a, a, a few months after the apportionment data. And if we, if the, the Census Bureau runs into challenges with uh, further challenges that delay substantively the apportionment data, that then have a knock-on effect for redistricting data and take that into the later spring, my understanding is, and you know, from uh, 
um, you know, from all that we've seen, that, that that could, you know, put some pressure on the states that do need to redistrict to, for legislative races this fall? Well, gentlemen's time has expired, and Mr. Gosar still is not ready to complete his questioning, or we're having difficulties connecting with him. Mr. Heiss, you are now recognized for questions. Mr. Heiss. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. I'm just going back and looking at some uh, stats from the past in the 2000 census under Republican control two, control two years before uh, the 2000 census, there were 18 hearings. Uh, the 2010 census, uh, Democratic controlled house two years prior before the 22 uh, 2010 census were 11 hearings. The years four and three prior to this census under Republican control, we had nine hearings regarding the census. And now the two years prior to this one, we have had only five hearings. And I must admit, uh, uh, the, the biggest bulk of the five hearings that we've had over the last couple of years have been uh, simply t hearings to bash the president and the administration. Not that there were not some legitimate uh, questions on the hearing, uh, on the census. There were, but by and large, we we're attacking citizenship question and attacking uh, Secretary Ross and so on and so forth. But we've only had five hearings. And now today, we don't even have representatives from the census here with us again. The, the census is counting every person in the country as they are required to do, but the president is right by insisting that only those who are here legally be included in the process by which we as a nation determine our governance. Uh, and yet, I, here again, Democrats are intent on ensuring that they tie up this process in order to get a desired outcome, which in essence is to uh, make sure that states with the largest number of illegal immigrants are actually rewarded with extra representation uh, that they don't deserve. So let me go, uh, Mr. Landry, thank you for being here. I'd like to ask you uh, as I get started here, uh, regarding the temporary restraining order and then the uh, preliminary injunction from Judge Coe, uh, that ignored the secretary's obligation uh, by law to meet the December 31st deadline to submit a final report to the president. Do you agree with that? Yes. Okay, so was that then in essence uh, compelling the secretary to ignore or perhaps even break the law? Yes. Yes, it was. I, it, look, I, the, the whole topic here is that California was basically hoarding resources of the Census Bureau um, when those resources were needed in other states in order to complete the census count on time. Well, so, so, so let me ask you, just in, in your experience, uh, for, for judges to order illegal action, is that a common practice by judges? Um, in the federal courts, in the liberal courts, yes, it is, unfortunately, uh, but it shouldn't be. Uh, the, the judges uh, should be bound to apply the law and the facts. So you, you described uh, in two, dif uh, two different uh, amicus briefs how the residents of your state uh, stand to have their, their right to equal representation diminished by these two really perverse legal efforts. One compelling the law to be broken, the other counting illegal alien uh, uh, in the apportionment, uh, which re actually rewards breaking the law. You, is that? That's correct, yes. I, I, I got a little confused between the two cases. We filed amicus uh, in, in an intervention in California in one case and then the New York case uh, that you may have been talking about earlier was where the president was trying to basically ensure that uh, we did not count illegals for uh, uh, reapportionment uh, in, in order to reapportion the, the House districts. Right. And both of those have had a, a 
understand to have a negative impact on your state. I, I, I go back and I, I just think of uh, the Democrats in this committee, I go back to April and in this committee uh, with COVID uh, as it was at that time, of course, April was a very insecure time. No one knew what was going on, but uh, in, in this committee, census stated in April that they were going to need a four month delay. But I would also remind everyone that it was also in April that the Postal Service announced that they were going to be insolvent by September. Of course, that did not happen. There was a lot of uncertainty going on in April. And, and as was brought up here uh, a little while ago, the uh, census met with us in August of this this year saying that that they were going to be able to meet the December deadline. So things that were predicted that were feared just simply never happened. Uh, Mr. Mim, what was the enumeration rate in the 2010 census? Do you remember? The uh, enumeration rate, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Do you mean the, the undercount from the, the 2010 census or? Yeah, the, the the enumeration rate. I mean, you said a while ago that the the one this year is ninety eight point nine eight. What was it in uh, twenty ten? Do you remember? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, the uh, um, it's it's a little bit of a, an apples and oranges. But what this is is when they when the census is all done, they do a, a major coverage measurement uh, effort in in order to assess the quality of the census. Um, the the two thousand ten census continued a pattern of improvement over prior censuses and had a uh, um, a net overcount of about 0.01%, uh, as was mentioned earlier by Mr. Santos, uh, that was different though by demographic groups. You did have a net undercount of non-Hispanic Blacks and Hispanics and uh, American Indians living on reservations. But the overall was a 0.1% uh, overcount. Um, again, that masks on the different groups. According to the the gentleman's time has expired, but the gentleman may answer the question. He, he did answer the question, ma'am. I'd just like to, uh, to conclude uh, by saying I would love to be able to ask some of these questions to census, but obviously I can't because they were not even invited to be here today. Uh, hopefully we will be able to speak to them in person in the future, and I yield back. Thank you. Well, um, I do want to say that um, some of my colleagues have complained that officials from the Census Bureau uh, or the Commerce Department are not here today. Well, let me just say that nothing is off the table going forward. We can invite them. This hearing was called because the Trump administration refused repeatedly to share information that the Oversight Committee requested over and over with our committee. We had to learn about major problems, not from the Census Bureau, but from the press. And then finally, we got more information from alternative sources that brought the information to us and felt that we should have it. I must say that we have uh, invite, we, we asked for information from Secretary Ross and, and from Director Dillingham, and they refused to give us the information. That's why we are now discussing the information that we got from an alternative source. We can certainly have Mr. Dillingham and, and Mr. Ross back to another hearing next week if you would like to request it we will certainly grant that to you we and the current question. status is excuse me this current status is that we wrote to secretary ross yesterday and we gave him one week to complete a, 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 a complete amount of documents that are unredacted a set of documents we requested last month and if he does not then he could very well face a subpoena. And I will also consider whether we need to hold another hearing to hear directly from him and Secretary Ross. And if you request it, Mr. Heiss, we will certainly do it. Um, I hope that he cooperates voluntarily. Now, I, I have to report, uh, announce that we have to take a very brief uh, recess because we have a vote Madam in our Chair. Democratic Caucus meeting right now. And I wanna give all of our members the opportunity to vote. The committee stands in recess for five minutes. Who's on deck? 
Who's on deck? I think they're coming back to me at Gosar to finish out my line of questions after the dim. Okay.
Walker. Uh, the chair now recognizes the Congressman Raskin. You are now recognized, Congressman Raskin. We can't hear you yet. Can you hear me now, Madam Chair? Yeah, yes, we can. Thank you. We can okay. hear you. Good. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Santos, is there any statistical benefit in requiring the Bureau to deliver apportionment data by the end of the year, despite having been forced to suspend field operations for three months? Shouldn't the Bureau actually have been given more time than usual to finish its work rather than less? Uh, I concur with, with that statement. Uh, as far as risks of accuracy of counts are concerned, uh, the shorter amount of time that the Bureau has to produce quality data, the higher the risk that something's going to go wrong. Okay, Mr. The, Mim, do, do you agree that this decision to rush the count and data processing could affect the quality and the accuracy of the data assembled? Can I see Mr. Raskin? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Thank you. From from a data processing standpoint, it does have risk. The initial plan from the Census Bureau, this is all pre-COVID, was to have 150 days of data processing. Um, that then went down to about 90 days, and now it's down to 77 days. And so it, it does put more pressure on them once they I, to both be able to identify anomalies and then promptly be able to address those anomalies that they do uh, identify. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, am I visible now? I was being told I wasn't on. Now visible. You are now visible. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Madam Chair, I heard some of our colleagues refer to wild conspiracy theories, but they never got around to the major one emanating from the President of the United States today, uh, who invites us to believe that somehow there's a conspiracy of dozens of Republican and Democratic um, elections officials and secretaries of state around the country, federal and state judges around the country, all of whom have rejected his ridiculous and nonsensical attacks on the election. So um, just as the president has been waging sabotage on the American electoral process, he's been waging sabotage and war on the census, which is of course central to the success of the electoral process in America. Administration tried to impose a citizenship question on the 2020 census, completely outside of lawful channels, and in a way designed to distort and depress census participation. It refused to back off this plan until the Supreme Court struck it down as arbitrary and unlawful. Uh, then when coronavirus hit and forced delays in the census, uh, and Secretary Ross and Director Dillingham originally tried to do the right thing by seeking a 120-day extension to deliver the apportionment count to the president. Um, then politics took over again and the president reversed course. And in September, the administration abruptly forced the bureau to shut down data collection a month early and insisted that it still produce the final results by December 31st. So we're just seeing a series of outrageous attempts to undermine and subvert the 2020 census, just like the outrageous attempts to undermine and subvert the 2020 election by the president. And now, of course, uh, they want to ignore the plain text of the Constitution and overturn centuries of governmental practice by not counting all of the persons in the United States as clearly directed by the Constitution. And uh, Mr. Mim, let me come to you on that. Is it not the case that there's been an unbroken practice of more than two centuries of counting every person as commanded by the Constitution? Uh, Mr. Raskin, that, that is my, my understanding. What I can speak of from experience is I've been working on census issues since the 1990 census. In 90, 2000, 2010, um, I don't recall this as being a, a, a topic even of minor conversation in, in any of those. The 14th Amendment says representatives shall be apportioned among several states according to their respective numbers, counting the whole number of persons in each state. And there are a number of occasions in the Constitution where the word citizens is used very deliberately, and other occasions when the word persons is used. And the reason why we have this unbroken practice going back to the very first Congress is because it's very clear that the Constitution says that when we count 
we count the whole number of persons. Um, and uh, let me ask you, if you were to follow um, the president down this particular primrose path, do we even have a way of counting people in different um, citizenship and immigration categories? Is there a database in the federal government that states with accuracy the citizenship status of every person who's in the country? Uh, Mr. Raskin, that's it. I'm, unfortunately, I, I'm not able to be overly helpful on that. Uh, that is not something that we've looked a lot at. I know that the Census Bureau is looking at literally dozens of different federal databases. Um, the overall, the individual and collective accuracy of those databases is, is not something that, that I can speak to, sir. Okay, and, and all of that is to say we're not set up to do this because it's not what the Constitution calls for. This is yet one more effort by the administration to politicize and destabilize and disrupt the census in violation of the Constitution, the laws that we passed in Congress to implement the census in more than 200 years of unbroken precedent. I yield back to you, Madam Chair. Your time has expired. Uh, we will now go to, back to Mr. Gosar, and, and we'll set the clock at seven minutes, uh, 30, seven, two minutes and 30 seconds. Uh, Mr. Gosar, you are now recognized. Thank you, and, and th sorry for uh, the inconvenience, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I, I'd like to first address the, the previous gentleman, uh, my colleague from Maryland, in regards to his comments or in regards to the election. I want to remind this committee that it's none other than the gentleman from Maryland that had some uh, 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 disbelief in the regards to the voting machines. Uh, that were utilized uh, in 2016 and, and the fraud that was in that election. In fact, the gentleman actually introduced legislation to actually uh, uh, to have federal oversight over the machine. So uh, let's be careful what we ask for. And, and I think I'd be watching Arizona re, uh, as, of, as of yesterday and today in regards to what the machines have done and what it has been picked up on. So I think all of us want a fair election, that one legal vote is cast for one legal individual. Uh, Attorney General uh, Landry, I want to get back to you. You know, uh, we were talking about the migration of uh, folks from blue states to red states like mine. Um, uh, do we have the means to track these migratory patterns to ensure that Americans count in, say, California several months ago, who have since moved to Arizona and are currently appointed, apportioned to their current location, not their former residence? Do we have the means to do that? I'm sure we would have the means to do that. Uh, yes, I, I would believe that the federal government would have the means to track that. And shouldn't that be part and of the, the, the anomalies or the, the final uh, dictation? Because we're seeing, I mean, it's my understanding is being reported that almost 800 people a day leaving the New York uh, state for Florida and Southern, uh, Southern uh, states. Uh, so it seems like that would be a va very valid number to be following, would it not, uh, Attorney General? Uh, Landry? It would be an interesting. It, it would be an interesting number, and I would guess that the U.S. Postal Service could be able to provide that information to the Census Bureau based upon the fact that those people that would migrate from, say, a state like California, New York, when they would go and 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 um, seek residence, say, in a, uh, a state like Florida or Georgia or or North Carolina, uh, would be changing their um, their address. Something like uh, what we've seen Democrats actually do from Georgia, basically say, come to register in Georgia for this the next election. That's something that uh, Henry? I'm sorry, um, the question broke up. Could you repeat it? Can you repeat the question, Mr. Gosar? You broke up. Can you hear me, Madam Chairwoman? Now we can hear you, but we couldn't prior. Mr. Landry, we've seen uh, 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 Georgia Democrats actually ask people to come and uh, come and vote in Georgia. We can't hear you now. We're, we're having I'll, connection I'll, issues. I will submit mine for the record. Go back. Okay. 
Mr. Grothman, you are now recognized. Mr. Grothman. Mr. Grothman, may, would you please unmute? Okay. Yep, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. A uh, couple questions. First of all, with regard to immigrants, as I understand it right now, are there immigrants in the United States, particularly from Mexico, who are voting in Mexican elections? As I understand that so? We can go with Mr. Landry, but otherwise someone else can answer too. Wait, could you repeat the question, uh, sir? Yeah, as I understand it, there have been there were articles a few years ago that Mexican immigrants in the United States, I think particularly illegal immigrants, but Mexican immigrants are voting or vote in Mexican elections. Is that true? I don't, I don't know that to be um, an accurate frac fact, but you could presume that if someone entered the country illegally uh, and is still a citizen oh. of Mexico, uh, then they could either return to Mexico and vote. Do other the other three people want to answer that question? I mean, I, I found an article, you just Google it and it shows up. And I, I was right in remembering that it happens, that efforts are being made by Mexican politicians to get people in America to vote in the Mexican elections. Any of the other three of you folks have a comment on that? I would say it's safe to presume it's true if you have a question following that. Well, it, it is true. I mean, it, you, you just Google it and you'll find out it's true. Uh, and I guess I think that that's a little unusual. Is it then, uh, I wondered if that's true, um, where they register in Mexico, I assume they must have a permanent residence. And if so, uh, are they being counted for census purposes in Mexico as well? Anybody know? Shouldn't we know that we have four experts here? Are people who are here Ill illegally in this country are they being counted? I mean, I would assume if an American, well, I'll ask another question then. If I am an American citizen and I want to spend three months taking a, a student, uh, spend three months in Great Britain uh, as a student for the fall semester, uh, am I then counted for the US Census? or not counted from the U.S. Census, not only am I going to be there for a year or actually less than a year, or what, what, what happens there? Sir, I'll, this is, uh, Chris Mim here. All, all I can speak to is what the, the residency rules and the, that the Census Bureau uses of the U.S. Census Bureau is and that they, they would... If well, the question is, see, see, it is highly relevant because we don't count people in two places, okay? If I live in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin, and I'm a student at the University of Wisconsin at Madison, it was earlier said that we have a problem here because a lot of people double count, right? Mom and dad think uh, Missy is a Fond du Lac resident, but maybe Missy is filling out her own form at the dorms in Madison. Uh, and we don't want her double counted. I think it's highly relevant as to whether people who are in this country are being counted twice in this country and in other countries as well. Does anybody know that? Or, you know, you're all experts okay. on the census. I, I can say definitively based on Census Bureau research that 8.5 million people uh, were duplicates in the 2010 census. And I expect that to be much greater this time around. What in percent fact, are duplicates? It, it was 8.5 million people were duplicate records, erroneous, uh, records that were included in the counts of the census in 2010. And they, plus some erroneous inclusions, uh, ended up counterbalancing the 16 million people that were totally omitted, missed from the 2010 census. And that's the only reason that the census in 2010 was hyper accurate. Okay, so you believe this time as well, we might be counting 8 million, 10 million people twice? Be they college uh, students? I, I think the duplication problem is going to be on steroids and it's gonna be much greater. 
Okay, well, that's reassuring. Is any effort being made to make sure that if people are saying they're residents in Mexico, let's say, or any other country, they're not also residents here? Census Bureau, do anything about that? No, we don't care. We're, we're, all of a sudden, we don't worry about accuracies. We have, we're, we're so accurate that we have 99.98% of the res, of the addresses we're doing something with them, but we got millions and millions of people who might be double counted in this. And when you when you give me these double counted numbers, does that just people who are double counted living in this country, or does that mean double counted like you're counted in the United States and in another country? Uh, it's a combination of things. It could it includes the college students counted in two, you know, college town as well as home. It includes uh, divorced families each parent of which wants to claim their own kids, and it includes uh, a lot of folks that have second homes. So if you live in Minnesota and like to spend your winters in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, you can end up showing up twice because you filled out the form in each location. Well, that's reassuring. We found something new today. Well, you time know? has expired. Thank you very okay, much. Well, and we now yeah. recognize Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Sarbanes, you are now recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Can you hear me okay? We can. Yes, we can. Great. Um, Mr. Santos, I wanted to um, hear your thoughts on a few things. Uh, you co-chair the task force of census experts at the American Statistical Association, um, and you've said in your capacity as co-chair that because its data are foundational to our democracy, commerce, and everyday lives, the nation deserves publicly available indicators to assess the credibility of the final counts. And I appreciate your testimony here today, uh, reinforcing this notion of accountability, uh, transparency, the accuracy of the data, and the importance of bringing in um, outside experts uh, who can give the public more confidence that the census is being conducted in an accurate fashion. Are you satisfied that the Census Bureau has provided all the data that you and other experts need to assess the quality of the census count? Uh, frankly, that simply has not occurred. Uh, we want very much for there to be more transparency. We've outlined in our document, in our workforce our report, the indicators that we know exist and could be easily generated and uh, put out to the public and to researchers uh, so that we could uh, establish for ourselves independently uh, the quality of the census counts. There's no question that there are going to be strengths and blemishes to the census counts. There are in any census. However, this time because of COVID and all of the challenges that I reviewed, I and others reviewed over the course of our opening statements, uh, we think that there is a severe risk for there to be highly uh, differential quality uh, aspects to the counts across the country. I want to ask you about two relatively specific um, components of the data. One is getting these measures, these quality measures assessed at the census track level. I'd like you to speak to why that's important. And, and the second uh, has to do with the non-response follow-up process. And I understand those numbers sometimes can be uh, put inside of the overall percent completion rate at the state level, but it's important to break out the non-response follow-up and understand exactly what's happened with that. So if you could speak to those two particular issues, I'd appreciate it. Sir, it, it is, um, as actually Joe Salvo has uh, indicated, incredibly important to get detailed quality indicators down to the census tract level uh, because we need to know whether some community census tracts basically are neighborhood level uh, types of indicators. We need to know the extent to which there are real problems, uh, not just knowing the total number of people there, but knowing their makeup so that we can plan for things like schools uh, and fire stations and things of that sort. Not to mention, uh, or not only that, but in terms of political representation, if you have a collection of census tracts that is undercounted, whereas 
the other, say, suburban uh, census tracts are overcounted, you're going to set up the inequality that and inequity that we've heard throughout this hearing thus far, where individuals end up getting less representation and federal funding than they deserve, while others get more than they deserve. I appreciate it, and I want to I want to emphasize what you just said because uh, fundamentally the census is about giving every person in this country the opportunity to stand up and to be counted, and if you don't have that kind of accuracy at the census tract level, as you just indicated, you can have a situation where some the voice of some people and some neighborhoods and some communities is being given more weight than the voices of other communities and other individuals in our country. And so you can perpetuate some of the unfairness um, and imbalanced distribution of sort of political power and voice across the country that already exists in so many ways. The census ought to be combating that unfairness, making sure that everybody's voice is given equal weight. So I appreciate you emphasizing that. But that's why it's so critical, Madam Chair, that the accuracy and transparency and integrity of this process be protected. I appreciate the opportunity to have us address that today in the hearing. And with that, I would yield back. Okay, the gentleman yields back up. Mr. Palmer, you are now recognized for questions. Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, this is a rapid response question uh, to yes or no so if you would answer yes or no general landry should we allow non-citizens regardless of their legal status to run for office in the united states wait could you repeat that again congressman i said should we allow non-citizens regardless of their legal status to run for office in the united states oh no sir okay uh mr mem same question yes or no uh, sir, that's that's not something as a support agency to the Congress that that I can offer an informed view on. Sure, you can. It's the law. But, uh, I would assume you're familiar with the law. It's a yes or no. Yeah, to the extent that it is consistent with the law, or the law, I would uh, agree that. Uh, but beyond the the policy concern, that that's not something I can speak to. Well, I'm not asking you a policy question. I'm asking you a question as to whether or not non-citizens regardless of legal status should be allowed to run for office in the united states uh, it, it, mr salvo yes or no i would um based on the law um that would guide my judgment well it's if a yes or no says, if the law if the law does not permit it the law does not permit it so your answer is no my answer is if that is the law of the land that is indeed the law of the land is. I would have to respect well, the law of the land. I'm gonna take that as, as an unmitigated, uh, you don't wanna answer. Mr. Santos should. I, actually, I very much um, uh, resonated with uh, Mr. Salvo's response. Uh, if, if the loss, if that is the law, then we should follow it. Then we shouldn't allow him to, should we allow him to make financial contributions or in kind contributions to candidates, uh, General Landry, yes or no? No. Mr. Mim. No. Mr. Mim. Well, sir, the, the, the law should be followed on this, whatever the, the law will be, and it's beyond my, my knowledge of the precise requirements here. Well, the law says no. Mr. Salvo. If the law says no, I would respect that. Mr. Santos. Consistent with the law, I would say no. Thank you. Uh, should um, they be, should undocumented residents, regardless of their well, should non-citizens, regardless of their legal status, be allowed to vote in our elections? Uh, General Landry. No. Mr. Ma'am. Again, it's whatever, uh, sir. Whatever the uh, the legal requirements are, we would believe the legal requirements should be followed. I'll take that as a no. Uh, Mr. Salvo. I would conform with the rules of the law if the law 
it's whatever the law says, I would respect that. Mr. Santos. What Mr. Salvo says, I would say no. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> um, uh, given that those answers should votes cast in this last election by non-citizens, including people residing here illegally be counted and allowed. General Landry. Is that a yes or no, or do I get to expound? Yes or no. No, they shouldn't be counted. Mr. Ma'am. A vote should be counted consistent with the law, sir. Mr. Salvo. Same vote should be counted consistent with the law. Mr. Santos. No. Okay, here's my point. Uh, obviously, a couple of you are, are, would like to equivocate on this a bit, but uh, we really, when we can, we should count everybody, but not everyone should be counted for enforcement purposes. And one of the reasons that that that's the case is the transient nature of a lot of the uh, of the uh, people who are residing here as non-citizens. Uh, about a third of the people who reside here will not be here for the next census, so it makes no sense to count. Uh, non-citizens for apportionment purposes, particularly when about six states account for over half of it. Uh, General Landry, are you, are you uh, concerned about the fact that there are states that have declared themselves sanctuary states uh, in violation of federal law to protect uh, people who are residing in the country uh, illegally? The gentleman's Absolutely. time has expired, but the gentleman may answer the question. General Landry. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Yes, I'm extremely concerned. I've been concerned about it now for five or six years and has ex have expressed and documented um, well-known statistics that show how unsafe these communities are uh, and that it is a public safety crisis. Madam Chairman, uh, I couldn't see the clock and that's Your time like has expired, five sir. minutes. Your time has expired. Okay, Mrs. Kelly, right, you are now recognized back. for questions. Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, Madam Chair. But I didn't know I was next. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I want to ask our witnesses about what goes into fixing the data problems that Korea Census Bureau staff identify in the documents obtained by the committee. Document number one includes a slide on page four entitled Comprehensive Patch Development Test and Strategy. This slide lays out a detailed 11-step process that the Census Bureau will follow to try to correct these errors. It includes developing patches to fix the errors, testing those patches. Hello, Madam Chair, can you hear me? And, th and then verifying that they solve the problem. Mr. Mim, why is it important for the Census Bureau to go through each of these steps when fixing the 15 different data problems they discovered? Well, thank you, ma'am, for the, the question. Uh, the, the importance of this is that each of these 15 critical anomalies, as they refer to them, that they're being critical, um, has its, its own set of root causes, its own set of problems, and they need to make sure, as your question implies, both that they get the individual fixes right but then the comprehensive patch makes sure that it all works together, that it can all come together um, again and, and provide a, an accurate count. Again, this is just the first step or one of the early steps, I should say, in the data processing. They have more to do, but even after the comprehensive patch is, is put in place and successful. Thank you. Let me turn to another slide in the same document. Slide seven is entitled Considerations and Risks. The fourth bullet states, if the sequencing of patch deployment isn't expected executed properly may result in other data anomalies. Why, Mr. Mim, why is it critical that the Bureau properly sequences the steps to fix each of the data problems they discovered? Because the, 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 the key point there is that subsequent data processing is dependent upon the earlier steps. And so there is a critical path. And in some cases they can do processing you know, simultaneously, different types of things, they're now at the point that they cannot move forward or, or largely cannot move forward to a subsequent step until they have fixed everything, uh, all preceding steps. And, and that's the concern that they have now. 
Okay, the three documents the committee obtained lay out the Bureau's detailed step-by-step -step timeline to fix these data problems. If the Bureau was forced to cut, to shortcut that process in the middle, could that impact the accuracy of uh, census data, Mr. Mim? Uh, the short answer to that, ma'am, is yes, and I think the Bureau, the Census Bureau professionals would certainly share that view as well. Thank you. Document uh, one also warns on page seven that more data problems could still be discovered. It states, and I quote, new anomalies are identified, they will be tracked, assessed, and additional time may be required for comprehensive release. Mr. Mim, given that at least two new data problems were discovered in the last two weeks, do you think it is possible that the Bureau will discover additional problems over the next month that will take more time to fix? I'd go beyond that, ma'am, and say be, it's not just possible, it's probable. And the Census Bureau actually expects that there will be some additional anomalies. What they're hopeful, and that's based on history, on 2010 and earlier, what they're hopeful is that these will be manageable and relatively small, um, and in which case then they think they can maintain a schedule. Where they would get problematic for the Census Bureau is if there are many of them or if they, you know, depending on the significance of those anomalies. Thank you so much. It sounds to me like this is a process that cannot be rushed. The Bureau can fix these data errors, but they, but that process must be done deliberately and carefully. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Higgins, you are now recognized for questions. Thank Mr. you, Madam Higgins. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, appreciate the, the the witnesses for appearing for us today, especially my my dear friend and attorney general from Louisiana, Jeff Landry. Um, my colleagues have stated again and again during this hearing and others that we need to get this right. We need to get it right, the census. So I would agree. But the most significant uh, identifier for getting it right for the American people is the question of after this census, what will happen with apportionment regarding congressional representation in our representative republic as that relates to illegal residents present here in America, counted for the census, but used for the purpose of, of apportionment? May I say that Americans, by and large, that I speak to across my district and across the country, are shocked when they when they are advised that this census could result and likely will result in the reapportionment of congressional representation at the expense of legal rural Americans, state by state, several states could be impacted, to the benefit of illegal residents and densities of populations in states that are identified as sanctuary the sanctuary states. It's it's shocking to Americans to think that that their Congress, their congressman or their congresswoman could be districted out, that their state could actually lose a seat so that California could get another seat because of illegal residents being counted for the purpose of apportionment. Uh, Attorney General Landry, you and I have had long conversations about the Constitution. Our Constitution begins with, with, with we the people of the United States. It does not begin with, with we the people of the world or we the people of the United States plus whoever happens to be here illegally. For the purpose of apportionment, sir, can you explain how allowing illegal residents to be counted for the for congressional representation of, of apportionment, how that would impact America as a as a former congressman yourself, you and you continue to serve honorably the entire nation. I thank you, uh, General Landry. Please give America an overview of just how how potential this problem, the reality of this is. And what will happen? What, where will these seats go? There's only 435 congressional seats. Tell America, Attorney General Landry, what will happen if illegal residents are counted uh, for the purpose of apportionment in this census? 
Well, to start off with, thank you, Congressman, appreciate it. Uh, to start off is to recognize what the goal is in reapportionment, and that is for everybody's vote to be counted the same, to have equal weight <clears throat> across the country in the House of Representatives. And so when you have a state with larger populations of illegal immigrants, uh, like, say, California, uh, who can't even vote in those congressional or are not supposed to vote in those congressional districts, uh, but then you count them in the census, you amplify, you amplify the citizens who can vote, the, the legal citizens in that congressional district against, you disenfranchise them, uh, you disenfranchise citizens, say, in Louisiana, right? Um, because you're amplifying the votes of those citizens against the, the votes of citizens, say, in Louisiana. <clears throat> and therefore, you're diluting those citizens uh, in Louisiana uh, who are, who, whose votes are not being uh, granted equal weight, say, to those votes in California. And that's the problem. Uh, we should only be counting American citizens uh, and in uh, the country in terms of reapportionment, so that as we are as we apportion congressional seats across the country, American citizens are granted equal weight across the country in representation in the House of Representatives. Again, you disenfranchise, say, African Americans in Alabama, Minnesota. Ohio this year, who this decade may lose representation in those particular states because we're including uh, illegal immigrants, illegal aliens in the census count for reapportionment. Thank you, the my friend. Time has uh, expired. Madam Chair, thank my you. time has expired. I thank you very much. And God bless you, man, for holding this hearing. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Lawrence, you are now recognized for questions. Mrs. Lawrence. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Uh, as you know, I represent the city of Detroit. And Mr. Joseph Salvo, in your testimony, you recognize how important it is, first, that it's enough time to deal with the problems caused by this pandemic, and second, that the data is transparent, detailed, and high quality enough. In spite of extraordinary efforts, Detroit final self-response was barely over 50%. I fear too many households were counted using less reliable methods. Example, examining administrative records, interviewing neighborhoods and landlords, and so on. Is my concern legitimate? And if so, what, can, what could that mean for the accuracy of our final numbers? Your concern is very legitimate, Congresswoman. Um, like in New York, we have many neighborhoods where self-response was very low. And um, as I've indicated, um, the Census Bureau has taken steps to close the gap. And in many cases, those steps um, may not have resulted in an actual contact with a household member. We need to know so that we can have confidence in the census and what they've done. We need to know how much of that happened we need to know how many housing units were declared to be vacant, how many might have been deleted from their list. Um, we need to know how many proxy responses were used. All of these will give us a gauge so that, frankly, we can have confidence that the career professionals have done what they need to do. I also want to state that an undercount in Detroit likely will cost, a, cost the city $1.3 million CDC grants to help prevent childhood lead poisoning, which is an issue in our city. The money could have helped the city test more kids for lead. Knowing this and what might be the effects of the anomalies on historically undercounted groups, specifically young children, low income families, black and indigenous and other communities of color. I want to know what can, what can, what can, how can we provide a guess on what kind of anomalies might come up in the next stage of data processing? Um, I want to go to something that uh, uh, Mr. Santos said earlier about duplication, about the idea that the Census Bureau needs to get a handle on how many people were living as of April 1 in the city of Detroit. 
for example, or the city of New York. There was considerable dislocation. A lot of it, we believe it's temporary, but it caused a lot of confusion. People uh, may have answered uh, in two different locations. The Census Bureau needs time to sort this out. If they do not sort it out properly, the number of people that would be, for example, put back into Detroit as of April 1, because they may have left, or put back into New York City as of April 1, will, will be smaller than it needs to be. Um, I want to mention something earlier that has not come up, which is on the census form itself, they ask if you have another residence or if you live someplace else, you've lived elsewhere. It takes time to get that information to look at administrative records, to look at all the sources. Maybe they don't have a name on the questionnaire. The Bureau needs the time to figure it out. If they don't, we could get hurt. The city of Detroit, the city of New York, and the funds that go with that will also take a hit. Thank you so much. Thank you. The dear lady yells back. I yield back. Thank you. The uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Keller. You are now recognized, Mr. Keller. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. The census is an incredibly important topic, and this committee's work on the matter has been essential for the hard to count people uh, like the rural parts of Pennsylvania's 12th congressional district. We need to ensure the Census Bureau has the resources and support it needs to successfully complete this work. By all accounts, Director Dillingham and the Census Bureau are on track to deliver a complete and accurate count. Anomalies being brought up during this hearing affect less than 63 one hundredths of a percent of the data being processed. And the director himself has said that these types of anomalies have occurred in past censuses. While I appreciate the chair holding this hearing today, the president's executive order on apportionment should not be controversial. Since we do not use data about the number of people visiting this country for the purpose of determining congressional districts, by that same logic, we should not use the number of illegal aliens either. Mr. Landry, what kind of discretion does the executive branch have um, to promote equity when determining apportionment numbers? Well, first and foremost, Congress has granted the executive department a tremendous amount of discretion in order uh, to conduct the census count. Um, and, and so they're, <clears throat> and, and of course, they have to confide with the Constitution as well. Uh, and so uh, the Supreme Court has said so much in a case called Franklin versus Massachusetts. Uh, so there's no question that excluding illegal aliens from apportionment promotes equality uh, because it prevents voter dilution. It's, it's interesting that many of the witnesses today, especially Mr. Uh, Santos, has consistently reiterated, and I agree with him, that people of color are being uh, disenfranchised. Uh, but I would submit that they're being disenfranchised because we're, or we are including illegal aliens in the count for reapportionment. Now, you actually mentioned the, the Supreme Court decision, I believe that was Franklin v. Massachusetts. Could you uh, elaborate on the importance of that decision um, with respect to the apportionment? Yes, yeah, so in uh, uh, Franklin case, the Supreme Court considered whether to allow federal employees serving overseas to be counted for the purpose of their home state's apportionment. And the Supreme Court said yes, uh, the, um, uh, that basically the secretary had the discretion under which uh, to de determine whether or not they wanted to be counted or not. And uh, they specifically said that the court specifically said that the secretary wielded a very broad authority to conduct the Senate, the census in a way that promotes equality. And so that grants the secretary a broad amount of discretion. And it's important to recognize that it's Congress, it's you all that gave uh, the secretary that wide discretion. 
Th thank you. And I, I just want to follow up on another thing. Article 1, Section 2 of the Constitution uses the term whole persons with respect to apportionment. Can you clarify the difference between whole persons and all persons? Uh, yes. You know, it, they look, if you take Justice Scalia's um, uh, comments where he warned against what, what basically is wooden textualism when interpreting statutory texts, the statute should not really be interpreted strictly or loosely, but basically they should be interpreted reasonably. So let's say no one has ever interpreted the phrase whole number of persons to include every person in the country because we don't count tourists, uh, we don't count corporations, uh, but yet corporations are persons uh, as well. So again, it just goes back to emphasizing the fact that Congress has granted the secretary broad discretion in determining how to define that and who exactly to include and not include. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I yield back. The gentleman yields back. Mrs. Uh, Plaskett, you are now recognized. Congresswoman Plaskett. Thank you so much, Mrs. Ms. Chairwoman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, as you may be aware to any of the witnesses, the American Community Survey and the Small Area Income and Poverty Estimate of the census are not inclusive of the territories of the United States. Even though these areas of the United States, nearly 4 million U.S. citizens are included in the decennial census. A parallel version of the American Community Survey exists for Puerto Rico, but not at all of the, not all of the other territories. And all of the territories, including Puerto Rico, some of the highest poverty areas in this country are not included in the small area income and poverty estimates of the census. I have been on record in favor of including all of these territories in these census surveys and data. Are any or all of you familiar with those surveys, um, both the American Community Survey or the small area income and poverty estimates? And would any of you be able to br briefly describe what each of them does briefly? Um, for us. Yeah, I um, work a lot with the American Community Survey. It is the basis for um, the uh, description or picture, drawing a picture of the socioeconomic characteristics of the nation. Um, information that used to be captured on what was called the census long form. Um, but that census long form uh, stopped in 2000, um, and uh, we in 2005 we had the first American Community Survey. It is a very large sample of the nation's population, and it is used as the basis for all kinds of work. Um, school planning. I can tell you from my agency, what my position, that we use it for everything. Again, education, income how people travel, get to work, all kinds of information that is very, very useful for city planners, for example, or for rural planners, or for anyone who is interested in the characteristics of the population. Or for us as legislators to be able to utilize that information to show why um, our areas need funding or don't need funding. So thank you very much, Mr. Salvo. One of the things I'm concerned with is because the territories are not included and because we are some of the highest poverty levels in the country, that's not, a, that's not an estimate, that is a fact. Um, and the primary reason we've been told that we have not been included is the lack of uh, the territories have been around insufficient funding or lack of availability of funding. In any of your opinion, what would be the benefit of including the territories, um, that's four million uh, for my Ameri my uh, my all of my colleagues. These are American citizens, not just residents. Citizens fighting our wars, a part of the draft. What would be the benefit to us of being a part of these census of those uh, those other surveys that are done? you would have a picture of the social and economic characteristics of the areas you're you're talking about um i i 
my knowledge of the Puerto Rico community survey is that uh, in that case, it's actually very thorough. Um, and, and again, with a substantial sample and provide you probably with the basis for the statements that you made um, earlier. Um, as far as the outlying areas are concerned, that is a matter of policy and, and, and is a matter of funding that has to be determined within the Congress and an appropriation needs to be made for that purpose. But there is no question that they would benefit from understanding the characteristics of the population um, that uh, actually is a benefit to the rest of the nation. Thank you. Um, may I just ask uh, the natural disasters, how has that, how might that have affected um, census taking and the sex census count in areas like the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, Northern Marianas that have not in anywhere near recovered from natural disasters in the past three years? Uh, it, crippled, it crippled the ability uh, of uh, to take the census in those areas. There's no infrastructure. Uh, there, the the people are still suffering to this day, and so it, it's tough to motivate them to participate, even if you can send uh, enumerators out there. So there's going to be a lasting impact on the inability to properly uh, account for the citizens of uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, because of the disasters and the impact on the ability to take the counts. Your time has expired. I now recognize Mrs. Miller. You are now recognized for questions. Uh, Representative Miller. We can hear you. Okay, good. I'm glad. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney and Ranking Member Comer. And I appreciate you all being here today as witnesses. As the census nears its conclusion in these coming weeks, I wanna commend the work that has been done by the Census Bureau to complete this year's count, given the difficult circumstances that have been created by the virus and the pandemic. West Virginia could have easily been one of the most difficult states in the nation to complete this year's census count, but instead it appears that it's going to be a resounding success and I would like to thank the Census Bureau for their diligent efforts during this time. I strongly support the president's action to protect the sanctity of our constitutionally mandated apportionment process so that all American citizens are represented fairly and accurately. I, I get disappointed when I think about the fact that my colleagues across the aisle and the media cheerleaders spent the last four years covering conspiratorial actions and ideas instead of really working on what we should be working on. You know, the Supreme Court is hearing arguments right now on the case that will decide the apportionment and the Census Bureau will be delivering their completed product within the next weeks. Attorney General Landry, how will states like West Virginia who abide by federal immigration laws be negatively impacted by unfair apportionment policies? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, as I explained uh, earlier, uh, when you include illegal aliens in the census count for uh, the basis of reapportionment, uh, states like West Virginia, who uh, may have a high population, say, of senior citizens, those American citizens are then disenfranchised by states like California that incentivize illegal aliens uh, to uh, reside and, and protect them in their particular states. And so basically those illegal aliens uh, <clears throat> are drawn to California. And then when we count them for reapportionment, the congressional districts are then weighted towards California at the expense of states like West Virginia. Exactly. Can you explain why federal law does not prohibit excluding the illegal aliens from congressional apportionment? Well, the federal law would allow us to. Uh, Congress has granted the secretary great discretion uh, in order to um, uh, apply uh, those types of, of facts. In fact, I explained earlier on a case um, that, the, that the Supreme Court had uh, issued in um, 
in, in under which the Supreme Court said that the, the secretary was granted wide discretion as long as uh, it, it, it passed a two-pronged test. And that was, and number one uh, of that is that it ensures equality. And of course, when you, when you basically weight those who are in the country illegally uh, and you grant them greater weight against American citizens, that certainly would not pass uh, the equality test and would grant the secretary the ability to exclude them in the reapportionment numbers. Is there Supreme Court precedent that shows the Secretary of Commerce has broad discretion to, discern, to determine the policy when it comes to the census and the apportionment? Yes, in the case of Franklin uh, versus Massachusetts, the Supreme Court uh, re reinstated the fact that Congress has granted or delegated that authority to the Secretary of Commerce and that that authority was broad. Could you explain how counting illegal aliens for purposes of the apportionment base actually creates incentives that encourage states to subvert enforcement of federal immigration laws so that they can be awarded greater representation in the House of Representatives? Yes, uh, as I explained again earlier, what happens is, is that states that have large immigration, illegal alien populations uh, will be granted greater uh, power on the federal stage, greater resources uh, will then basically go to those states at the expense of rural states that either have large senior populations or large uh, minority populations. So again, you, you take a state uh, under which, say, Minnesota, uh, African Americans in Minnesota will be disenfranchised at the expense of California, which has gr a greater illegal alien population. Uh, and so again, it creates this system under which states are incentivized uh, to go against the system, to basically uh, encourage illegal immigration in those particular states, uh, rather than to abide by federal law. Thank you. The gentleman's time you has say expired. The gentleman, thank you. The gentlelady reels back up. Congress. Woman Presley, you are now recognized. Thank you, Chairwoman Maloney, for convening this hearing and uh, with the urgency that it truly deserves. We cannot risk endangering the livelihoods of millions of Americans by compromising the integrity of our census. The United States of America needs a complete and accurate count of all people. That is what the Constitution demands, and it is what my colleagues and I are required uh, in order to do our job effectively. As lawmakers, we rely on population data to inform our policymaking and to ensure that our communities get the fair share of more than $1.5 trillion in funding to support everything from our transportation systems to education and healthcare infrastructure to small businesses and to nonprofits. For example, look at SNAP, our nation's most impactful anti-hunger program. Census data informs how to allocate its budget of more than $60 billion. Across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, SNAP helps one in 10 residents. And in my district, one of the most diverse and unequal, the Massachusetts 7th, nearly one in five households receive SNAP benefits. Food pantry lines in East Boston and Chelsea have been growing even longer over the past few months, underscoring why SNAP funding is so important. SNAP puts food on the table for our elders, supports our working families. It ensures that our children don't go hungry. The Census Bureau must take appropriate steps to process and tabulate the final census count to ensure that social safety net programs like SNAP reach the people who need them most. The ongoing pandemic has proven that these government programs are popular and absolutely essential. So as we chart a path for COVID recovery, the census count will serve as a critical data source to ensure the hardest hit communities receive their equitable share. Mr. Mim, how important is the accuracy of the 2020 census in ensuring a fair distribution of federal funding? Well, ma'am, I think you, you laid it out just to, exactly right, is that it's, it's instrumental. Hundreds of billions of dollars, in fact, estimates have been over a trillion dollars that, that we've seen over the next decade will be driven in whole, of, of federal funds, will be driven in whole or in part 
by census data. And that's not just the counts, but it's also in some cases with, with some programs, uh, demographic breakdowns, whether it be by age or gender, you know, depending on the, the type of the program. Um, so we need to have a full and complete count, and we need to have that count be accurate in terms of the demographic characteristics if we're going to adequately and sufficiently um, allocate federal, very scarce federal resources. And, and Dr. Saville, how much of your professional work occurs at the municipal level? Um, can you elaborate on that and how issues like housing and employment are impacted by an inaccurate census count? Yeah, um, all of my work, virtually all of my work is done in the neighborhoods um, of the city. And uh, I can give you a few illustrations, one that is very Please. close to my heart. Um, uh, when a school has to decide um, to redraw a boundary around it, um, uh, the uh, Department of Education would come to us and ask us, how best do we draw this boundary? So we take data for census tracts in small geographic areas, and we assemble it, and we look at the number of school children. Okay, we supplement that, of course, with the American Community Survey data that was shown earlier to try to figure out how many of those children are in need. Okay, how many of those children are below the poverty line? And we create a picture uh, for the Department of Education that allows them to figure out how to optimize the drawing of that district. Now, if those children are not enumerated, they are not accounted for in the census. And the American Community Survey, which is based on the census, does not show those children to be present. We make decisions in the absence of information, in essence, and it handicaps us. So uh, uh, I can give you a number of illustrations like this, but this is just one way that it really matters at a local geographic level what this Census Bureau has done. We need to understand it. For example, how many of those um, <clears throat> children were, um, were, were, were missing or not missing one of the reasons why I ask this is because, as was alluded to earlier, omissions and duplication are not generally in the same place. Neighborhoods do not generally have this offsetting influence where you could, in essence, end up with the correct number by virtue of errors in either direction. Okay, Areas with large numbers of omissions tend not to be those areas with a large number of what we call erroneous enumerations. So all of this needs to be taken into account. We need to understand what the Census Bureau did, okay, in order to um, inform our strategies. Thank you. And Dr. Savala, so it's fair to say that, you know, for co those communities uh, uh, historically uh, marginalized and under-resourced, uh, stand to be disproportionately impacted. Um, those that have been um, historically uh, hard to count, Black and Latino neighborhoods, immigrant communities, uh, my district is 40% um, uh, foreign, foreign born residents and 53% people of color. Almost 40% of our households are single female headed. Um, so if we don't get this right, it sounds like what we will see is a tsunami of hurt across the issue. Uh, not only that, it will be. This time has expired. Um, and I, you may answer briefly. We've been okay. called to a vote. Uh, Thanks, uh, uh, yes, uh, it will continue for 10 years and basically reinforce inequities um, that all, were pre-existing uh, for the, like I said, for the next 10 years. Thank you. The gentleman's ladies, time has expired. We've been called for a vote, but I now recognize uh, Representative Comer. Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam you. Chair. Uh, before I begin my question, let me, let me say this. I, I do appreciate your and your members' sincere desire to ensure the integrity of the census. And I appreciate your willingness to hold additional hearings on that. I wish you all had the same sincere desire to ensure the integrity of the 2020 election because a lot of Americans expect Congress to at least hold some hearings to see what went wrong and ensure that moving forward, we don't have any doubts about the integrity of our election. That's the role that this committee can play. That's your decision. 
And I strongly encourage you once again to allow us to have a hearing as soon as possible on the integrity of the 2020 election. Having said that, I want to thank Attorney General Jeff Landry for testifying today about a topic that's very important to his state and all of our states. Uh, I hope that his testimony uh, in the committee today uh, helps everyone have a better understanding of the president's action on apportionment and excluding illegal aliens from the apportionment count. Attorney General Landry, on Monday, the Supreme Court heard oral arguments in New York versus Trump case. You filed an amicus brief on behalf of your state and several others. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And can you explain why you decided to file an amicus brief in that case, why it's so important to Louisiana and the other states involved? Because what we want to ensure is that everyone, every American or every, yes, every American citizen and every American citizen in the state of Louisiana and other rural states around the country, uh, that their votes are not diluted. And by, again, counting uh, illegal aliens for the purpose of reapportionment disenfranchises uh, minorities in Louisiana. Uh, it disenfranchises senior citizens in Louisiana. Uh, and, it, and, it, and it can restrict the amount of federal resources to those communities who need them the most in those particular states. And that those resources will then gravitate uh, and migrate to states that uh, embrace sanctuary city policies defying federal law. Each state's member of Congress is their voice and their vote in Washington, and I know you agree with that. Giving a voice to individuals not lawfully present dilutes citizens' voices. Isn't that correct? That is correct. Why does including illegal immigrants in the apportionment base throw a wrench into the machinery of congressional apportionment as you describe it in your brief? Because, again, what happens is, is that uh, if you count illegal aliens in the country, uh, what you will find is that those populations have swelled in states that have embraced sanctuary city policies, uh, states like New York uh, and states like California. They will gain additional congressional representation uh, at the expense of states like Minnesota, Alabama, and Ohio. Uh, and so basically you're creating congressional uh, districts that represent people who came into the country illegally uh, and do not uh, enjoy the rights, the, the complete rights and privileges of American citizens, but yet they will have representation in the House of Representatives. So you agree that a voter's vote in one congressional district should be worth equally as much as any other person's vote in any other district? That's correct. And what, Go ahead. And what's more absurd is that, so let's take, for instance, uh, we all recognize, uh, and it's not disputed by any of the members, uh, that the Secretary of Commerce has excluded foreign tourists. Um, people who are here in the United States on tourist visas uh, from being counted in the census. Yet if that person, uh, under their theory, by counting them, then stays in the, in the country past the point of their uh, visa, they, for some reason, are now counted. Uh, again, it leads to absurd consequences. And wouldn't you agree that apportioning according to the whole number of persons in a state can reasonably be interpreted to exclude illegal aliens who are re residing in the state unlawfully. Absolutely. Under the Supreme Court precedent, the secretary has broad discretion uh, to determine that. And let me conclude my questioning by saying this. I think an overwhelming majority of Americans agree with everything you said, Mr. Attorney General. Uh, that's the position that the Republicans on this committee have taken, uh, and hopefully the Supreme Court and the Trump administration will be able to uh, do the right thing on congressional reapportionment. Thank you again for your testimony here today. Thank you. Okay. Um, Ms. Tlaib, you are now recognized for five minutes. Representative Tlaib. Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, and thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I want to make sure to share with all of the folks um, testifying today uh, of our letter, the letter that I sent along with um, Congresswoman Lawrence on this committee to
to director of the Census Bureau about some of the really great, unbelievable concerns and allegations that we've seen come out in regards to the 2020 census in Michigan. Um, in Detroit, the overall self-response rate was about 51%, which is lower than any other large city in the nation, with some tracks as low as 4.4%. Uh, Mr. Meme, you know, one of the things I want to explain to folks, what does it mean when you say self-response? Is it me personally getting the form and responding directly? It's uh, this time it's been a combination of that, ma'am. It's been um, the, the paper form, but it's also been a huge internet response option. This was a, an option that they had this time. And in fact, uh, almost 80% of the uh, responses that they got uh, of self responses came through the internet. So in absence of self response, the next strategy for the census, am I correct, is to uh, employ uh, you know, other processes, protocols and things like that. Uh, so that they can get more accurate count. What are the what are the, some of those other processes they have in place if self response is low? Well, the first the first big step was then to hire uh, several hundred thousand census takers to go out and, and actually knock on the doors. Um, if they were successful, and then meeting with a, a, a member of that family to or the member of the residence rather to to then enumerate it, they would complete the case there. If they were unsuccessful, and the rules you know are a little bit different, to, um, they would either use a proxy that is a, a knowledgeable person, a neighbor you know that could um, uh, complete that for them. They also supplemented that with administrative records. Um, and then at the end, if neither of those work, there will be a, a very small category left over in which they'll use a statistical imputation. Uh, for all the panelists, uh, you should know, given the low self-response numbers in Detroit, the process needed to count about 100,000 non-responding households. And so that means organizing boots on the ground and doing that stage that Mr. Meem talked about. The Census Bureau, under resourced, of course, we all know, closed outreach offices, multiple kinds of outreach programs. In Detroit, multiple census enumerators uh, actually have come forward uh, to Director Meem and everybody on the panel. They alleged that the Bureau did not follow proper protocols or provide them with necessary support to count every person. I was there when one U.S. Census enumerator, Mr. Benson, had publicly t said that he was a census worker in Macomb County, which is a nearby county uh, uh, to my district, in, uh, which I represent, Wayne County. The census in Macomb County was being handled extremely well. He said that additional work was needed in Detroit. And he specifically said, what I found was, quote, when I reached out to people I knew working the Detroit census, they had not even started yet. He also said they were waiting on work and hadn't received any cases. Again, these are census workers in Detroit that was assigned to Detroit. One Detroit census captain, Ms. Foster, also indicated shortcomings. She said, quote, as far as proxies, it was unsafe and unorganized. Some days I didn't even get cases until 5 p.m. when I would put in my time from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. Given that there were around 100,000 non-responding Detroit households that needed to be contacted, there was no reason for the census enumerators to not have work to do. So, Mr. Salvo, why is non-response follow-up so important when there are uh, low self-response rates? Um, the self-response self provides the best data. The research clearly shows it's Census Bureau's own research. Once enumerators go into the field, um, as was indicated just now, uh, uh, the, there are a whole number of options that, that can rule the day, so to speak. Um, for example, the use of administrative records to determine whether a unit is occupied or not. Uh, looking at postal service records. Yeah. And I don't want to. I know what you mean, but like, what, it is important for accuracy, and I think that's what you're trying to say. And, and these are the processes. But what if the processes weren't followed? I mean, I know the my, our mayor in the city of Detroit, myself, and many others are looking uh, to see what the final number is. But I mean, you know. This means a communities like mine are gonna get undercounted because obviously they didn't deploy the same standards in Detroit that they did in a nearby Macomb County area that's, that, uh, you know, again, is not, you know, a number of communities of color like it is in Wayne County. Low self-response does lead to a higher probability of undercount, no question. That is, has been established. And what we have to figure out though, is whether the, every census has people who come forward. 
the metrics that were mentioned before, that they're endorsed by the American Statistical Association, by the Census Advisory Committee, will give us a look into that world. It's called a paradata, is what it's referred to, data about the process. That information will give us a glimpse of what you're talking about. That is one of the reasons why we have to get it, because if we're going to have confidence that Detroit was properly enumerated, we need to get our hands on that information. And uh, that will tell us Thank the you. story. Absolutely. And Chairwoman, um, if I may, uh, I know we have to go. Uh, I would love to work with you directly in making sure, again, the information is going to come out. It looks like Mr. Salvo is waiting for that information to come out. I, I really urge our committee to play a very, very key leadership role, because I do think what happened in Detroit was intentional on the part of this administration and not doing it properly and having enough folks on the ground and being able to give folks work. Again, 51% um, non-response rate, uh, and, and for them not to have enough work or have a enumerator sitting around for hours, Ms. M Madam Chair, I just do think that we need to fully investigate that so it's not repeated again. That's a good point. The gentlelady's time has expired. Our last uh, questioner is uh, Vice Chair Jimmy Gomez. You're now recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I really appreciate that we're having this hearing. Um, the census is something that we've cared about since um, since I got to Congress and something we've been working on, and a lot of the, my worst fears came true. Um, my district, it's the 34th Congressional District in downtown Los Angeles, east side, lowest response rate of any congressional district in California, lowest one, and it's probably one of the lowest one nationwide. So um, we have been concerned and we've been asking for documents from the Census Bureau or the Commerce Department time and time again. And to get the documents and hear about the issue from the press is, is really disheartening. Um, so I have some um, questions um, that I wanna kind of get into regarding uh, from the GAO perspective. So Mr. Mim, um, has the Census Bureau provided all the information to GAO that you requested about the data anomalies discovered by career staff at the Bureau? No, sir, they have not. It's the and it's not so much the Census Bureau. Our understanding from senior census officials is that it's uh, under review uh, by the general counsel at Department of Commerce and the uh, Department of Justice is being bound up with the litigation. Um, has the Bureau provided details about the number, type and complexity of the problems that they have identified? Uh, no, sir, they have not for again for those those same reasons. Is this the first time the Census Bureau or you know, the Department of Commerce has withheld information or declined to answer questions from GAO about the 2020 census. Um, it's, you know, there, there's always back and forth between GAO and agencies about what's pre-decisional and, and all the rest. Um, th this has certainly been, uh, what I can say is that it has gotten uh, more problematic in, in recent months. And I mean, certainly since the, the middle of the summer, um, been very difficult to, to get information. We have not been flat out denied anything, but things are taking an extraordinary amount of time. For example, the replan that was announced on, uh, in uh, August, um, we're still waiting for uh, detailed information on that. On the on the replan of which part the I'm sorry the the decennial and in and in particular how the uh, the Census Bureau was going to be able to take what had originally been a 150 day planned processing then went down to 90 and now if they meet the statutory deadline will be 77 days um, we we just wanted to say how are you going to be able to do that and uh, um, so, we're waiting for that information as well again so that's you, not the so Bureau of Open Commerce. So you're waiting for information on a plan that was supposed to, they were ex supposed to explain it ahead of time, right, before they did it, and they never provide, it's over, right, the count's done, and they you still haven't received any of that information. I find that... <laughs> now, sir, and I'll give you one particular example that's important for us is that, you know, the Census Bureau has... Um, state subject matter experts that review the census data, you know, each decennial. Last time, um, they, they on the basis of these reviews, every single state had to have their their numbers rerun. And that doesn't mean that there were errors in every one, but they they identified questions or things that they that were of sufficient um, uh, concern that they reran the numbers. The time available for these internal census uh, state level experts. Um, has been reduced this time around. Um, we want to know what, if anything, has been cut out of that, or or what what are they doing to to make sure that it'll still be a quality review? Again, we're waiting on the Department of Commerce. I'm I'm glad you brought it up because some folks in my state have 
California have mentioned that state review um, by the demographers, and they're they're really concerned about how that's going to impact. So, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and and we know in the past, GAO has provided recommendations to the bureau to help the bureau better address their workflow workflow schedule transparency and prioritization. Over the past few years, how many recommendations has the bureau given to the Census Bureau? Yeah, we've had over a, a, over 120 recommendations on, just on the decennial census, sir. Um, okay. I, I'm happy that the, the great majority of those have been accepted by the Census Bureau, and, and we've been able then to, to make some substantive improvements as a result of that. And that's the, the point to the, the, you know, getting us access to the information. It's, it's helpful to us. It's, it's, it's good from a transparency standpoint, but it also helps us identify targeted and specific improvement opportunities, which our experience has shown leads to an improved census. And so this isn't just kind of a geeky access kind of issue yeah. between, you know, or article one, article two issue. This is this helps us actually help the Bureau improve the undertaking of the census. And you mentioned they, they accepted, do you know how many like rough number um, they've accepted and implemented, implemented of your yeah. recommendations? Uh -huh. Of those 120, over 90 of them have been accepted, um, and there's a number of them that are outstanding. As uh, um, the report that we're issuing today um, that uh, talks about the, the need for the transparency on the data that uh, uh, we've been discussing all throughout this hearing, that's one where the, um, the, the Commerce Department has accepted that recommendation, and so we're hopeful yeah. that it will be implemented as well. Yeah, well, thank you so much. And I know GAO doesn't do it just, you know, in, uh, investigate just to um, cause problems or to play gotcha. It's a, to improve the process. So I want to thank you. I also applaud the, ch uh, the chairwoman's efforts to obtain the critical doc documents from the Department of Commerce. I would also like to ask if the committee could send a letter requesting the information that GAO is seeking as well. There's no reason whatsoever that this committee should not know exactly what's going on within the Census Bureau's data processing operation, as well as the state um, demographers when when it comes to their request for information and how that's impacting how much information they've gotten, how what has been cut out. Um, Madam, Sec uh, Madam Chair, we we know that Secretary, Secretary Roth is withholding the documents from us and they basically admitted that they are concealing them from the judiciary. So now we are also hearing that it, it is withholding some documents from GAO. Um, I think we need more transparency. I applaud once again the chairwoman's um, thank you, thank you so much. Point. The gentleman's time has expired, but before we go to close, I want to give Mr. Comer a chance to offer any closing thoughts. Mr. Comer, you are now rec recognized. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Again, uh, it's always our responsibility to hold hearings to ensure the integrity of the 2020 census. It's unfortunate that we didn't have any witnesses from the uh, Bureau uh, current staff, employees of the Census Bureau. Uh, I think that all the data that uh, we've been given proves that uh, everything's going according to plan. And I applaud uh, Director Dillingham. I think he's been transparent with uh, both the Democrats and Republicans on the committee. I look forward to getting that census data and hopefully we'll be able to do what a majority of Americans want. We'll have a true accurate count of every single person in America, and we will have a count that is used for congressional reapportionment that excludes all undocumented immigrants. That's what the American people want, and that's what our position is uh, as a minority on the uh, Oversight Committee, and I hope that we will be able to achieve that. With that, Madam Chair, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The message from today's witnesses is loud and clear. The 2020 census is in grave danger. Census experts testified today that data errors identified by career officials at the Census Bureau are serious and must be fixed. They warned that if the Trump administration cuts short the process to fix these problems, the census uh, account risks being inaccurate and incomplete. We call this hearing because the Trump administration refused to share information with this committee about these critical data errors. We had to learn about these major problems from reading the newspaper. When we asked for documents about these problems, these problems, the Commerce Department blocked them. 
Thankfully, we were able to rely on other sources to get at least some of these internal documents. So just to recap, we wrote to Secretary Ross yesterday and we gave him one week to produce a complete and unredacted set of documents we requested last month. If he does not, then he could very well face a subpoena. As I said earlier, we hope he com complies voluntarily, but I am open to calling Secretary Ross to uh, testify under oath before this committee if he does not produce the documents that we requested. In closing, I want to thank our panelists for their remarks, and I want to commend my colleagues for participating in this important hearing. With that, without objection, all members have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing is adjourned and we are off to a vote. Thank you.